Hey, Missouri Nation, Jason here, Commercial Pilot Podcast, taking you through a Commercial Pilot mock check ride. What is happening, M Zero A? Jason Shepard here. Welcome into the Commercial Pilot Podcast today. Like we've been doing all this month for our mock check ride May, working you through and taking you through a commercial pilot level mock check ride. And I've I've shared this story with you before. I've shared it on the Commercial Pilot Podcast before. The closest I've ever come to failing a check ride was the commercial pilot check ride. Never failed a check ride, thankfully. The closest I ever came was that darn commercial pilot check ride. You know what happened? I took the terrible advice that someone gave me that said, hey, it's just a glorified private pilot check ride and nothing could be further from the truth. That is, that is a big old lie. Those of you who've taken your commercial, back me up on this. It is not a glorified private pilot check ride. It'll be the hardest check ride you do if you choose to stop there. If not, CFI will be your hardest check ride after that, but they just progressively get more and more difficult. And this is why we have such a responsibility as pilots to take it up a notch. Why does the commercial pilot check ride even exist in the first place? It's because we're now flying for hire. We are now adding money to the equation. We're now required to fly at a certain level of professionalism. And this is why we're held to such a high standard. So I'm gonna be reading to you today from Pass Your Commercial Pilot Check Ride, which many of you already have on Audible, on iTunes, uh, ebook, audiobooks, however you consume your content as well. We're gonna dive right into that here today. And I'm just gonna read along with you. And here's how this is gonna work. If you, if you haven't listened to the Private and Instrument Pod podcast this month so far in Mock Check Ride May, um, I ask the questions, I pause just for a little bit to let you think about the answer. In a perfect world, you would actually say the answer out loud, um, if you're driving or whatever that may be, uh, and then I'll reveal to you the correct answer. That's exactly how I do it in the audiobook. All right, are you ready? What three factors affect density altitude? What three factors affect density altitude? altitude, humidity, temperature, and altitude or elevation. High humidity, high temperature, high altitude or high elevation all increase density altitude. Density altitude is what? What is the FAA's definition of density altitude? Then what's Jason's definition of density altitude? The FAA's definition is pressure altitude corrected for non-standard temperature. You say that and you go, okay, what's that mean? Jason's plain English definition for density altitude is where the airplane feels like it's at. If, the air, if density altitude at the surface, standing on runway 36, is 2,500 feet, as 23 Mike Zulu rolls down runway 36, it is going to perform and act like it's already at 2,500 feet, which in a naturally aspirated aircraft engine, that's an engine that breathes without the aid of a turbocharger, you know I get a decrease in performance as I increase in altitude. Hey, there's three different, well, there's more than this, but there's three main different types of air speeds. What are they? And what do they mean? Three different types of air speeds. What are they? And what do they mean? They are indicated airspeed, calibrated airspeed, and true airspeed. Indicated airspeed is the airspeed, well, you read it right off the airspeed indicator. Calibrated airspeed is the indicated airspeed that is calibrated for the instrument and installation error. True airspeed is the airspeed the airplane is actually flying through the air. The airspeed is only true if it's at sea level, standard temperature. So to calculate true airspeed, you must take into account the standard temperature and current pressure altitude and the outside air temperature. Let's talk about flying at night. When we're flying at night, do you mostly use the cones of your eye or the rods of your eye to see at night? We use our rods to see at night. The rods are actually located in the periphery of your eye as well. So 
This is why our, our scanning technique for traffic at night is to stare at a space and use our periphery to pick up movement. That's because we're using our rods. Hey, what are some things, by the way, you can do to prevent night blindness? Right? You know, you just get that bright light in your eyes. You, you burn off that rhodopsin is the, actually what, what your eye produces to see at night. Um, what are some things we could do to prevent night blindness? Well, you could use an aviation red or aviation green light. That's a good answer. Avoiding bright lights, pre-flighting with a flashlight um, out there at night. Avoiding those bright white lights is the main thing we'll actually end up doing there. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, hey, how does your carburetor heat work? Some of you are never saying, I don't have carburetor heat, Jason. It's all fair game though. You're a commercial pilot. You're gonna fly all types of different airplanes. How does carburetor heat work? Carburetor heat is unfiltered air that is pulled off or over the exhaust manifold, which then gets blown into the carburetor to melt the ice. So what are some problems with something like using carburetor heat? Well, that key word there, I said it is unfiltered air. It's unfiltered air. We don't use carburetor heat in our uh, soft field landings because you could kick up a bunch of dirt and junk and throw it straight into the fuel system. All right. Um, hey, what are the differences between de-ice and anti-ice systems? Some of you are thinking, Jason, I fly a 172 G1000. What do you mean de-ice and anti-ice? All fair game. You are, you are aspiring to this level. Sorry for the extra noise of me flipping pages here. I'm literally reading the book with you along here. De-ice versus anti-ice. A de-ice system is used to eliminate ice that has formed. An anti-ice system is used to prevent ice in the first place. What would happen if your vacuum pump fails? Again, you might be saying, Jason, I don't even have a vacuum pump. It doesn't matter, right? You're still quizzed on this sort of stuff. What would you lose if the vacuum pump fails? Well, you're going to lose your vacuum, your suction instruments. Typically, that is your head indicator and your attitude indicator. Typically, typically. There, there may be some other aspects to that. Um, all right, let's look for some more. Um, what is an MEF? MEF. I'm talking in reference to a sectional chart that helps you. What is an MEF? An MEF is a maximum elevation figure. It represents the highest elevation of the highest feature, including terrain and other vertical obstacles, towers, trees, etc., within a quadrant. Within a quadrant. Interesting, right? Uh, let's see. Hey, what are the different, this is gonna take a second to think about, so I'm gonna have a long awkward pause here. What are the different types of special use airspace? What are the different types of special use airspace? I teach the acronym MICPRON, MICPRON. The M is for a military operations area. The C is for a controlled firing area. The P is a prohibited area. The R is a restricted area. A is for an alert area. W is for a warning area. And N is for a national security area, like a TFR or an NSA. Um, I, I kind of group those two together. They are a little bit different here as well. Um, in 91-103, we learn about a thing called required pre-flight action. List to me some of the items we can find in there. What is considered required pre-flight action? Back to the acronyms. I teach NW Craft. Craft with a K, like the macaroni and cheese. NW, as in Northwest. Northwest Craft. The N is for notums. The W for weather. The K is for known ATC delays. The R is for, for runway lengths of intended use. The A is for alternates available. F is for fuel requirements. 
T is for takeoff and landing distances. NW craft, Northwest craft, 91103, that is required pre-flight action. Hey, tell me the rule uh, on the use of alcohol and drugs in and around an aircraft. We learn about that in 9117. It says no person can act or attempt to act as a crew member within eight hours after consumption of alcohol, while under the influence, using any drug that affects the faculty of the pilot, an alcohol concentration in the blood of 0 0.04, 0.04 or greater, or any person who appears to be intoxicated to be carried in the aircraft. Let me say that last part again. Any person who appears intoxicated to be carried in the aircraft. I say this because you're going to go on to become a commercial pilot. You're going to do charter operations and you may fly someone who was partying a little bit too hard or, or doing something they shouldn't have been doing, whatever that is. You've got the responsibility and it's in the regs to not carry someone who appears to be intoxicated. When is an ELT not required? When is an ELT not required? You learn about this in 91207. Aircraft engage in scheduled flights by scheduled air carriers, not required. Aircraft engage in training operations conducted entirely within a 50 nautical mile radius of the airport from which the flight began. Flights engaged in the aerial application of chemicals like crop dusting or other substances for agricultural purposes. Airplanes equipped to not carry more than one person. Hey, what is the 5P checklist? What is the 5P checklist? This is from the FAA, by the way. This isn't a fun acronym Jason made up. What is the 5P checklist? This checklist helps the pilot make key decision points from pre-flight to landing. The 5Ps are the plan, the plane, the pilot, the passengers, and the programming. The 5P checklist. If you are loving this mock check ride series, well, on May 31st, I'm doing a live mock check ride. May 31st on the M0A YouTube, on the M0A Facebook page, you won't wanna miss it, uh, at 8 p.m. Eastern time. There are details down on how to, how to RSVP for that. We want to see you there. That is May 31st, so please, please, please make sure you're showing up there. You know, we do these mock check rides every, the last Tuesday of every month with our online ground school members. Just always going above and beyond, ask questions, they type in their correct answers through the chat. We just have such a good time with it. If you need a great online ground school, don't forget about M0A for that written test, for that check ride, most importantly, making that safe real world pilot. Check it out, two weeks free, m0atrial.com. Will you leave us a review on iTunes or Audible, wherever you're listening to this? Um, Will you go ahead and subscribe on YouTube, like us on Facebook as well. And in the meantime, have a just blessed, abundant, outstanding rest of your day. And most importantly, remember, the good pilot is always learning. Have a great day, everybody. I'll see ya.